be part of the healthcare system as it's organized. Um, and there's also different levels of uh, mental health care. Uh, there's the private system, which works for some, and then the public system is overcrowded. Um, but in terms of suicides, that was a big topic uh, during Maria and after Maria. Uh, I think we still don't know the exact number of suicides that happened after Maria. Um, I was working with one of uh, reporters that called me. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, she called me because um, of the post I, I shared in Facebook. Uh, one of the physicians I was working with, uh, she was distraught one, night, one day uh, because uh, one of her nurses had, go had gone house to house, which was like two weeks after Maria, uh, in the uh, barrios uh, around Caguas. And uh, she went to this home and she found uh, a boy and a girl, you know, seven and nine, uh, next to the grandmother who was uh, bedridden and covered with scars and, and, and animals. She had been in bed uh, for quite a few days and she was all soiled. And, um, you know, the nurse came in and took care of the grandmother and then she asked the kids, you know, where's your mom? And they said, well, our mom left. And, um, and you know, they took care of the kids, they gave them, they were dehydrated. And um, then the nurse kept on, uh, you know, doing the visual inspection of the house as they usually do. And in the back room, they found uh, the kid's mother had hung, hung herself. That suicide never got reported. Um, and like that, people, uh, kept sharing stories after I posted that people kept sharing stories about uh, people jumping off bridges um, and there was a whole investigation and actually uh, a good friend of mine uh, Dr. Lynn Goldman she's the dean of the school for public health recently told me that they had they're about to start an investigation of suicide in Puerto Rico with a contract with the government um, I don't know if that's going to find out. She's very serious and her team is very is well organized, but I don't know if they're going to be able to find this out because there's not a registry that is updated for suicides in Puerto Rico. And there's really not support for suicide vi victims and their families either. And I know that because my younger brother committed suicide in 2001. And there was really no support for any of us. Uh, and some of us don't even talk to this day about that. Some of our brothers, there's six of us left. We don't talk about it. We never talked about it as a family. It's like taboo. Mental health is taboo in Puerto Rico still, you know? Um, uh, so, so. Not only the the system provisional services, but also from us as a society, how we look at mental health patients and how we think uh, the worst of them do are when we don't have mental health problems. You know, we will always feel depressed or, or anxious or, or uh, uh, you know, go up and down. And I think we develop strategies to do that. Our own thinking we develop strategies at the same time to see how we can fix the system and, or create a system that supports that. But I think we have to start with each one of us, you know, before we ask outside, oh, what are they doing? What are they not doing? What am I doing for myself? Because if I'm at peace and I, I can understand my moods and deal with them, then she's going to feel better and she's going to feel better and she's going to feel better and my family is going to feel better. And when there's a crisis, then we can work together. Through it. Um, yeah, so in terms of um, uh, mental health, uh, just like Rafael said, if you have the money, you can access psychologists and psychiatrists, you know, pretty readily. I mean, you have a wait time. I know this from experience as well. <laughs> I've been through this system. Um, so um, for, for family members, and uh, it's very expensive, right? So to see a psychiatrist, the first initial visit was $175. Oh, 
Do you understand the medium income in Puerto Rico? That's out of the reach of most people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's not, it, nobody takes insurance that you can find. It's cash, you have to pay cash. So the subsequent visit is cheaper, it's $100. But again, look at them, you know, how do you access that? So if you have a um, disorder, right? If you have a, a mental health disorder, maybe you're bipolar um, and you need medication, consistent medication, how do you access that system? So then if you do have some kind of healthcare system, the wait times are so long. Um, I, I can tell you from personal experience, you know, I, I, rather, I, I got sick in Puerto Rico, I was living there. I, it was much easier for me to fly to New York, see the doctor in a week, right? And then fly back. But everybody can't do that. So yes, there's a spike in this. The other thing that's important to note is there's no Freedom of Information Act in Puerto Rico. So access to data that we would want in terms of rates, you have to, you can ask for it, but there's no Freedom of Information Act. You're not going to readily get it. Then you have to use the court system to navigate to get that information. And that takes a long time. So to get this picture, it's going to be a little tough. Okay. So we have a lot of comments and we have 15 minutes and we have to come up with an action plan. So I'm going to take two quick comments and then we're going to move on. So um, Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't you all state your questions and then we'll see how we could address them all together. So I just wanted to make a question said. There is a report about suicides in 2017, but it's not accurate. It's from the Comisión para Prevención de Suicidio and the government. And the report was about 253 suicides in 2017. The, uh, okay, lo voy a decir en español, la tasa de suicidio por 100.000 habitantes subió de 5.8 to 7.6. But those numbers do not report cases. I also heard about that case. Um, I work with a nonprofit organization for Rico psychiatrists, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, but we're all here in the diaspora. What we've been doing is going to different neighborhoods with uh, the partnerships that we've created with community leaders and nonprofit organizations. And what we're doing is trying to get people to talk about their trauma, first with community leaders, and if the leaders want us to talk to the community, we do that too, and we have models of uh, curriculum that we do. Depending on what they need, we're trying to make sure that the leaders and the communities tell us what they want. And it's usually very cathartic. You know, people come out and talk about their experiences. We do uh, psychological first aid, mindfulness, something that uh, is evidence based that's called the Hope Models from George Washington University. And we have a couple of other trainings to explain to people how to, the usual process of grieving after a natural disaster is actually the same as losing a loved one. Yeah. So uh, I can provide if anybody is interested in, my, in that information, but in terms of people like you advocating for the, the importance of, of accurate data, I think we all have to get together and really start uh, lobbying and really putting pressure with the media to get that problem. It's the same as the deaths. You know, there's not reliability in all of the people that passed away shortly after the hurricane from the complicated medical. Uh, and the last thing, sorry to take so long, there. Uh, I am working uh, indirectly with the Mental Health Association of New York and the Disaster Psychiatry Outreach Program. We were just in the American Psychiatric Association meeting, and uh, they are about to finalize finding budget for a conference that's going to be about how to bring um, psychiatric and mental health care into primary care. There's a model called collaborative care that has been studied and done in Puerto Rico, but not very successfully because working with public health in Puerto Rico is very difficult administratively. Mm -hmm. uh, so some attempts have been done, but now we're hoping, uh, we're working with the Academy of Medical Directors of Puerto Rico, and they're focused on the Tres Treintas, which we call here FQACs or federally qualified health centers. They have a federal core grant to uh, provide health care for the underserved and the uninsured. I live in Florida now, and it, it, all of my, I work with uh, persons uh, without a home, and um, if we didn't have FQACs, they wouldn't get care because we don't have expanded Medicaid like here. So we're trying to see if, they, if, if some champions from Tres Tentas can acquire the collaborative care model. It's a, it's a way for not everybody needing to see a psychiatrist directly, working with case management and other techniques and consulting with a psychiatrist. And we're trying to bring some possibility of telemedicine to help out with our small nonprofit to provide uh, some consultation. So there's a conference that's gonna be called Disaster Preparedness and Response, Increasing Capacity for Shared Knowledge 
a case for care integration, and it's going to be in San Juan on August 9th and 10th. If anybody's interested, do you have a brochure um, or card or something? I don't have a brochure because I'm not the organizer. This is a SAMSA and yeah. MHA, but I just wanted to let you know. And uh, later on, you know, I can provide information. They don't, they don't, they, they're trying to do this really fast. I think that that's a risk because there's not enough time for people to make plans and go and participate, but they want to provide the, the training and start the connections and the so, work as soon as possible. so just to comment, I'm an FQHC and I've been working very closely with the Association of Puerto Rican Community Health Centers, the FQHCs. So however we could work, um, I, I will link them in and, and the, I know sure. like Salud Integral de la Montaña is yeah. yes. super really, See, really good. Yeah, really. Uh, and so, so the rest of your comments, if you could just kind of phrase them in a way that leads to actions, just because we're really running out of time. We have 10 minutes, so, okay. Well, wait, well, one second. I think the woman yeah, back there was, yeah. um, I'm sorry. I, I hear all, everything that everyone is saying about, you know, the trauma and the mental health issues in Puerto Rico, but I have a question um, for Ms. Aponte. Um, in, in your um, work here in the community, have you encountered people from the diaspora also having PTSD from Hurricane Maria? Because as people in Puerto Rico were suffering, you know, intensely what was going on. They didn't know what was happening in the whole island, but we were watching it yeah. on the news, on Facebook and everything. Yeah, right. And up to this day, I still, you know, if yeah. I see a photo, I, I start mm -hmm. crying because I, yeah. you know, go back to that time when I couldn't find my family and it was so desperate. So has anything been done to kind of extend, you know, the focus of some research mm -hmm. that, you know, is available to members of the diaspora of us who were watching what was happening there. To be still, honest, you know, and to be well. direct, no. Yes, but that, that. <laughs> is a, but very, I think it's a very interesting perspective. It it's very good. Study. Absolutely, and that's yeah. perfect. Okay. That's a perfect action item. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Nate Sainzina, I'm counsel with the New York City Bar Association of Men's Real Career Work, particularly the Jody, the JT, PHO, the Bayou, Organize legal brigades and hear your voting a plane full of doctors. So that's fantastic. Um, um, I had a question about the death toll, which was already raised. But my other question is Are any of you aware of any local incentives, tax or otherwise, to try to retain doctors on the island or otherwise bring them back? I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I just could tell you this with my many meetings with government and CBOs that um, they were going to or may have already passed the legislation to. Um, uh, it, I guess, entice and provide incentives to doctors from a tax perspective so they can stay on the island. I, I know that I, I'm so immersed in what I'm doing that that's like a subsequent <laughs> issue yeah, for me. Can I comment on that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was uh, passed. The problem in Puerto Rico right now, the situation is so unstable in terms of uh, the structure of the government, uh, the way the executive branch is working uh, with the legislative branch, the way that PROMESA is working with the executive government and the leg le legislative branch, the way Congress is working with Puerto Rico, PROMESA, and the Puerto Rican government, yep. that one law, wait, hold on, one law is passed today, and then three days later, something that is passed that contradicts what was passed today. Or it's passed, but there, there's no follow-up. And, and you, we still don't have a fiscal, a fiscal budget, what they call the plan fiscal, we still don't know what it is, you know, and that's going to determine what's happening, what, what gets cut, what gets funded, mm -hmm. and what how the government is going to be run for the next five years. So <coughs> forget about it. So Not countries really. don't get paid in months, like, you know. Okay. Well, I, um, I, I, I don't know if you address uh, the issue of telehealth or telemedicine, but I'm, um, I, I build networks, and I'm now in Puerto Rico trying to physically real satellite-based infrastructure to allow uh, services to be provided, especially in the, um, in the, in the mountains where there is no radio connectivity, but throughout the island, the lack of doctors, uh, telemedicine now presents an opportunity to bring services. Uh, the lady here brought a very important point, one that in my life I have gravitated to whenever there is a disaster, is to address the mental health problem. Mm -hmm. and the point she brought in, very few people mentioned, but our community here suffer as much mm -hmm. as the people in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. okay, with the lack of communication. Mm -hmm. 
uh, not knowing how people uh, are and how they're doing. And we need to come with programs, and I recommend some uh, action, some recommendation. We need to bring programs that will allow to connect both communities. Uh, right now, I'm, 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 um, I was told I'm gonna be working with a group of EIDAS, you know, seniors. They didn't, they didn't have uh, phone service until about a month ago, okay? These people need to connect with their relatives here. And that's an example. And um, I would propose that you recommend the use, and my friend Rafael here is a very strong advocate of technology, um, that you recommend the use of um, uh, technology or techniques like telehealth or telemedicine to be able to address the needs of the Puerto Rican community uh, in Puerto Rico, but also connect with the, with the Puerto Rican community here as well. Because we, our community, I don't see it as three and a half million, it's mm -hmm. nine million. And that has implications in terms of how we should approach some of the solutions to our problems, because it's not only there, it's here too. Right. Thank I, you. I would like to just comment on sure. what's that. So we said, I agree with him completely, and then I think we this this should be structured by age groups. For example, like my kids, they only watch YouTube, they don't watch TV. So you know, we should create a YouTube for uh, Puerto Rican kids here and in Puerto Rico, a YouTube channel, uh, and that they contribute content and, and let them organize themselves because they have other ways of looking at life that I know I, I will never get there. Uh, but the same thing is that we have to educate our seniors how. What's the benefit of using social media, uh, you know, Skype or, or FaceTime? It, it, make that available and, and have them see the face of their loved ones here. Uh, there's so many possibilities of technology that nowadays. And it's a matter of being creative and resourceful and, and looking at opportunities that are really low cost because they're already, the infrastructure is there. Can I just one important point? <clears throat> I just, um, I, and I'm not going to talk about the issue with telehealth, but I just want to also um, have you all consider when you're proposing these ideas, the impact that telemedicine would have on displacing local Puerto Rican doctors. In your discussion of any creation of a program, you have to think about the fact that we cannot continue to lose doctors on the island of Puerto Rico. People need touch and that I work with prisoners in Puerto Rico that do telehealth. People need touch. It's a big difference when you can actually mm -hmm. take somebody and say, how are you feeling today? Especially, in the last Especially yeah. when it comes to our yeah. cultural perspective. We have to have cultural sensitivity when we use yeah. technology. And that lack of touch and that lack of cultural sensitivity in the promotion of, of programs is something we have to be conscious of. That's, that's just my message. Right. Okay, we had a few more comments. I'm gonna push this to the end. So I know you did, and I know this gentleman here, this in person, right? And you have the, and we'll say your comment the last one. Yeah, you have the last one, could you add the first one? Okay. Go ahead. One of the questions I want to ask, the main question first, is there a connection with you're doing with the issues called TBI, traumatic brain injury? Would you say there is a connection? With traumatic TBI? brain injury. TBI, traumatic brain injury. Is that considered as such? Okay. Well, some people, I'm, I'm connected with organization of a TBI, traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And because of that reason, I've gone to see, speak to my congressman. Uh, why? Because the Hispanic, particular Puerto Rican community, has not been involved of, uh, to be part of the task force. Because there is a system, in the system of America, that, that there, there's a task force. And the task force is for people of TBI. Mm -hmm. So right now, at this moment, there's no Hispanic or Puerto Rican congressman, which I have approached to Velasquez and the other gentleman from uh, Chicago, et cetera. But what I'm saying, if there is a connection, and even though there is some connection, you know, with uh, with mental under TBI, mm. and if you were in Puerto Rico and it banged you in your head or anything like that, that could be. And for that reason, there should be a way where they could establish a relationship of that, of speaking to our congressmen, for they could be part of the task force to come in strong, come strong to give attention to this type of discipline. Okay. Well, thank you.
I'm familiar with TBI, so I, oh, and I know New York but, State has a lot of structure around TBI. But if it could be done so in terms of that, that's a good point, model because that's something I'm initiating. Okay, great. My question is really brief, um, but I guess. Like in, we're really focused right so like on like services that we provided like here now, but looking like longer range and stuff, uh, we're in building systems, but also looking at the medical education and like uh, training. I'm just wondering how we can incorporate like all these ideas that are being shared into actual curriculum and like clinicals and stuff. Uh, I know it's a really broad like action item, but like it's no. noting, mm -hmm. like so one of the things that we're working on as an initiative, our, one of our initiatives is um, developing MOUs between teaching medical schools here. Um, and, and Judith and I are actually going to have this conversation after this, before this panel. And we've been having it too, Paloma. We've been working on establishing um, connections from the US mainland, of, from medical schools, um, nursing school, all types of schools that deal with these particular issues and institutions over there for a long-term strategic plan because this is going to go on for the next decade or more. Um, so it's not something that we want to stop now. And maybe we can address some of these issues of how do we retain our doctors? How do we make doctors come back? You know, If we could do it through MOUs and academic institutions um, and then building the curriculum around this post-disaster um, educational experience, right? And in, in, incorporating that in terms of approaches to healthcare post-disaster and going forward, because June, we're starting in the hurricane season. Great, and I think that there's some models already that exist out there yeah. that we could just build upon. Great idea, thank you. And last, yes, last one. point. <laughs> one of the models that I'm, I think you guys also might be familiar with uh, was during the big AIDS epidemic that we built, the, the I bridge, was connected yeah, with the right. Latino Commission on AIDS, and we built a bridge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, between Puerto Rico and he in New York City with doctors, getting them involved, the doctors here, the doctors there, and build a bridge to help the person. Yeah. Is that something that that is still is still going on, or is it something that you could you guys could do as a plan between Puerto Rico's doctors, the doctors here for people that are coming because of the hurricane? Is that maybe so, the kind so of bridge I, that you're thinking about? So I know that the air bridge for HIV stopped. No, no, I'm not talking funding, about HIV. Right, talking but just the example, the, yeah. the model. Um, I think it's always revolved around funding and how do you how do you support mm -hmm. an incentive? So that would be that would be yeah. the funding to create a bridge between the medical uh, community here and the medical community in Puerto Rico. Well, we did that. Florida. We did that already. You did that already. Um, that's how we that's how we send medicines to Puerto Rico. We would get a, a, a list of uh, medicines that were needed mm -hmm. from physicians in Puerto Rico. Yeah. It was sent to physicians here in the United States. Some of the physicians would buy the medicines, and then some of the people would get the plane and organize it to fly to Puerto Rico, and there was a, then physicians on the receiving end. That's, that physician-to-physician -physician network is already established. And that's what we're working on to have it in, in place for the next European system. Okay. And, and that's one slide. I think it's sharing on the disaster response. I think we, get more, we need to get more organized. We have a long term yeah. plan, like what yeah. we're working mm -hmm. on. I agree. Work, I agree. Work, work. We need to have sustainability. Mm -hmm. and, and this is only a model. Mm -hmm. the, the situation is that, like I mentioned before, only the federally qualified health centers in Puerto Rico are really stable right now because. Even though Congress approved full Medicaid funding for Puerto Rico, which uh, you know had never happened before, the money is still here. It hasn't gone to Puerto Rico. So, so you know, talking about all these ideas and all these plans is, is good, it's nice, it's great. But we have to realize we are in an uh, extraordinary situation right now. Nothing is happy is working in Puerto Rico as it should be. It was never working really before, but now it's worse. So it's, it's interesting because the things he's talking about, like um, the medicines that are coming in on the list and yeah. doctors, Boricua and all that, we just met and I work with those people in Puerto Rico okay. during, the, during the thing. So back to this point is, I think your proposal is, um, could we, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, could we consider the, um, a strategic plan that's unified and holistic Yes. That is a more um, macro approach mm -hmm. to trying to resolve this problem instead of 
and, and Rabbi's point is, could we bring everybody together? And, and it, that, it, so Paloma's first thing that Paloma said was, let's identify some of the obstacles or uh, challenges that we have encountered. This is one of the biggest challenges, the diaspora and the island, you know, in, in terms of doing that, because we have so many people that are trying to fill in the gaps immediately, and they're all great efforts, but we don't have an umbrella that is collating all of this. Good. I'm, thing. I'm glad she's here because what I think we're doctors were not really good at is with advocacy. We're not trained for it, and Sorry. we try to stay away from it because we associate it with politics. Mm -hmm. If there could be a coalition that is formed between people that have the resources here to go to different state governments and federal government to advocate for fiscalizing the money that is given. Mm -hmm. Right now, a money was given to ANSCA, and I spoke to the to someone very high top in the University of Puerto Rico Department of Psychiatry, and she can't really get le legitimate mm -hmm. information on how that money is being implemented. You know, that's a good point. So, you know, and, we and need to advocate the, for and, it. And mm -hmm. historically, uh, what's happening now in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. is similar to what happened after the hurricane uh, in 1928 and the hurricane before the, uh, the turn of the century, in which there was a period of complete social dislocation and in the 30s, at the beginning of the 30s, it was the same thing. You know, there was no trust in the government, so so the federal government didn't send the money directly to to the government of Puerto Rico. They created an independent organization of lead community leaders, uh, which eventually became the nucleus of the uh, Popular Democratic Party. But at that point, it was not. It was different representatives from the civil society, and they received the money from the from from the government, and that's how things got started in the 30s moving along again. So maybe this could be a, a good moment to go back to history and, mm -hmm. and start to identify that as an alternative, uh, using it as, uh, as a vehicle to implement the action plan that we're proposing. Great. Um, we're out of time. Um, I, wa I, I just want to ask uh, Senator Rivera, who we don't always have elected officials in our sessions, if you have any closing thoughts or remarks that you'd like to add. Only two pages. <laughs> <laughs> in shorthand. Um, <laughs> I don't have anything I can put in a minute. I just, the, the only thing I'll mention here is a version of something I mentioned before. But yesterday, um, I was kind of roped into a panel that I was not uh, originally participating in, but ultimately, I we have to deal with root causes. We have to deal with root causes. We have to, I, I believe that as a, a Korean community, we have to sincerely commit ourselves to an anti colonial process. Because, I mean, I was just writing here, we have we have immediate concerns which have to do with, like, let's say a month, right? In the next month, who are the people that need immediate assistance that are going to potentially die without it, dialysis patients, all this stuff. So then there's the short term, which is anything after a month, say to two years out. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that from here to two years out we need to do in the midterm would be from two to ten years. One of the things that we got from the system two to ten years, and long term, ten to the next fifty years and beyond. And so we we so in, in, and I could place a lot of the stuff that you were talking about, I could place it in different categories. But if we don't have a, a sincere conversation about the fact that all of this shit. Huh, could be traced right back to, to, the, to the colonial situation in Puerto Rico, and we're nearly going to move anywhere. And, that, and that's, and it, and it, it is, again, I would have some, I, I don't know why you asked me. No, 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 no I didn't ask. I mean, that's what anyone said. <laughs> only, only because it seems like I'm ranting, but I, but I can't, I, I, as somebody who's born and raised in Puerto Rico, I've been, obviously, I've been, this has been rattling around in my head. If somebody studied political science and then got into politics and government, it's been rattling around in my head for years. And for me, it just the, the storm crystallized in such a way. Mm -hmm. Anyone who can look at what, what occurred and what's still occurring and deny that it has been not only exacerbated, but it is directly related to the colonial situation in Puerto Rico, you know, you also can yell at the top of the top of the that's so that's my that's my very productive Good. Yeah, well, I, I, would like, I would like to just comment on that I, I agree completely I didn't want to mention it before not to politicize the issue but 
we need to uh, talk about the colony of Puerto Rico, how we can, we have to end the colony yeah. of Puerto Rico. It has to finish. Yeah. We That's cannot true. continue being colonial people. We have been oppressed for over 500 years by Spain and the United States. And we have to figure out how they're gonna deal with that and how we're gonna deal with them. They have been robbing us, they have been exploiting us, they have been humiliating us. And we are strong, we, we, have, we are united now. We have to work on that strength and come together and decide as a group how we're gonna face this situation and deal with it because it cannot continue to go on any longer. In spite of any differences with the In spite of the differences, that unites us all. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all.